This is the road, if you can call it that, that leads to the Pert Creek School in Letcher County, Kentucky. There are tens of thousands of roads like this, winding back along the creeks and hollows of 11 states. And beside these roads, the shacks of tar paper and pine, which are the homes of a million permanently poor. That cabin down there belongs to Letcher West. George and Janie and Maggie West use this road to get to school. At this time of year, they never get there with dry feet. Down there is where Johnny Sandlin and his wife and 11 children try to stay warm all winter. He digs coal out of a little mine, and they burn up most of the coal he digs. That's Carl Parrott's place. He, too, is a hardworking man. He has to be. Up there is the Bakers. They've been divorced for eight years, but he's too poor to leave, and she's too kind to make him. So he lives in that little house in the back, and she cooks him his meals three times a day. And beyond the Bakers, up on the hill, is the Pert Creek School. And up there, on this one day, is the only sign anywhere in this hollow that it is Christmas in Appalachia. Christmas in Appalachia. A CBS News special report with Charles Carroll. This is the only Christmas carol many of Virgie Sumter's pupils will hear this year, the one they sing themselves in their one-room schoolhouse on the day of the Christmas program. It falls the job of one of the older boys to keep coal on the stove at the Pert Creek School, just as it is the older girls who fetch the drinking water from the spring. Mrs. Sumter is busy enough teaching seven grades in this one room and trying to keep the schoolhouse clean. She also cooks the hot lunch at noontime. The food comes from the government. Some of the children can afford the 20 cents a day they're supposed to pay for lunch, and charities in the region pay for the others. But the charities themselves are so poor that they often raise money for the hot lunches by selling bootleg liquor. And so by one means or another, Janet Baker, who lives in that cabin just below the school, and the others in the room, get this one hot meal a day, even if food is short at home. The miracle is that Christmas reaches Pert Creek at all, without songs and without Christmas trees and without gifts tied by ribbons. Janet Baker's mother still preserves from habit or from memory a part of what Christmas used to be. That is Janet's good fortune, and that is a measure of the strength of Ollie Baker. We have our family home together, and we all, we have been a close family, and we miss each other for their away, and we look forward to them coming in. Well, Look what we got today. Oh, let's see. Uh, Bible pictures. Show me the Bible pictures, Janet. What, what are they? Some of them has Jesus in it. Mommy, you know that story has about Mary and Joseph mm -hmm. laid on the, the hay? The Bible school teacher learned us, uh, you know, she had it up her day. Where the baby Jesus lay on the Yeah. Head? Well, it's in that book, too. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. Mommy, I know my spell and I just brought my rim tick. Well, all right. You put your books in there then okay. on the... Take them in there and lay them on the bed. Okay. 
Is, I suppose Janet's looking forward to Christmas, isn't she? Yes, she sure is. Well, when you were a young girl and living on this creek, uh, Mrs. Baker, uh, what was Christmas like back then? Well, my father raised hogs and chickens, too, on the farm, and he had his cows. So he would uh, take a big ham. They'd cook it and have it for us to eat through Christmas. We'd have a company. Uh, the children would come in. Sometimes our aunts and uncles would come take Christmas with us. So he would have his ham meat, and they'd bake cakes, sometimes a lot of gingerbread for the children that would be coming in to eat, too, for them to eat till they wouldn't be underfoot till they could always get dinner on the table. <laughs> That's the way we, in our family, I always read the story to the children, you know, the baby, Jesus was born in the manger. And um, the best part, I think, it means to me if I'm thankful if my children are all well and can be in good health on Christmas. And then I'm thankful to the Lord for what we have. Even if we don't have so much, I'm thankful for what we do have. What the Bakers have is a son, Freddie, who is 20 and who must take daily injections of insulin in order to stay alive. What the Bakers have is a mule, a small one, bred to haul coal cars out of mines. There are now far more mules in this hollow than there are mines to work in, so Freddie uses the mule to drag timber off the hillsides. What the Bakers have is their sad way of living, divorced, separated by law, and held together by necessity. Bob Baker couldn't eat if Ollie Baker didn't feed him, and so she does. And what they eat, what Janet and Freddie eat, and what the mule eats the scraps of comes from a government warehouse. There's nothing unusual about that, not here in eastern Kentucky, where nearly half a million people this month heard the ingredients of their Christmas dinner called out to them on the surplus food line. One box of peas, two pounds of butter, two pounds of rice, four pounds of beans, Two bags of meal and one bag of flour, two pounds of lard, two cans of eggs, two cans of beef, and one roll of wheat. Sign right there. This food comes from the United States of America, which has too much of it. It goes, in old feed bags, back into the hollows of the Cumberlands where there is never enough. It keeps people alive, that is all. You can't make Christmas cookies out of government commodities. See you next month. You can make biscuits to grow cold and hard on the stove. Ask Elsie Hall what he liked best about going to school last year, and he will answer you, lunch. This year, he doesn't have enough clothes to go to school. Elsie is one of six children. Their mother says she has enough to think about today without thinking about Christmas. Norman, who is nine, does think about Christmas but living here with his grandmother in a house heated only by the generosity of a neighbor, Norman knows not to speak of Christmas. An older boy was killed one night by a shotgun blast. His grave is just behind the house with that of an infant sister. And just across the road is the place where Lewis Hall, the father, worked. Now, between the graveyard and the dead mine in the one room of his shack, Lewis Hall waits out the winter. Sit here, Mr. Hall, and uh, see your children, all but one of them unable to go to school. What kind of feelings do you have about that? I feel like they all were to be at school. But I, I feel sorry for the kids that they're not learning. They ain't got no learning, no education. But they ain't nothing that I can do about it. Only just move as I can move, but that's slow. I think they, it's better for them to be in school than it would be just up and down the road here. Would they like to go to school? Yeah, I think I think my kids like to go to school. It's just the sort of the key. They, they just they don't know it's embarrassing to them to go uh, in the condition that they're in. I think if they had clothes and had the way like other kids that they would learn good. But they feel embarrassed to go in front of other kids in the conditions they're in, so they wouldn't learn that. Just be no cause to send them the way I see it. 
Lewis Hall's house is a dark and silent place. It is commonly said in these mountains that when hard times come, love goes out the window. And the Christmas spirit, of course, cannot change those it does not reach. That is not to say that the spirit of Christmas reaches nobody in eastern Kentucky. Hiram Mitchell does love his neighbors, and it seems to him that some months he gives them more than he sells them. What you need, that lady? Oh, Bathing her little one. Small one. In what next? Well, now we thank you. Thank Come back and see us. I don't think I've seen you sell anything that's uh, worth more than a dime or 20 oh, cents. Any to a dime. Hardly ever get in a quarter bracket. Cigarettes every once in a while. You think you'll be able to stay in business? Well, I don't. <laughs> I'll have to stay until I can get out. Or a man that's uh, got a, any kind of a heart in him at all, he can't sell something to eat. And people are starving. And them are coming in bagging you for it every day and telling me I've got nothing to eat. Well, you have to put them out or something or another. Keep them going. And when they come up and can't pay you, why, that hurts a fellow like me. But then their little families will come back and say, I ain't had a bite for two or three days, and so we'd have to let them have something to eat. I do. I can't do like some of these big markets just say, no, we don't do no credit here. <laughs> so, well, what about your own family? Uh... Mr. Mitchell, where where have your children scattered to? Well, my children scattered around. They got six lives up in <coughs> Indianapolis. Yes, sir. <coughs> then what else? That's it. How'd the rabbits go this morning? How many did you kill? None. None. How many did you shoot? How many did you miss then? Never seen one. Never see none. Now we thank you. Come back and see us. I have six lives up in the Port, Indiana. I have one lives in uh, Detroit, Michigan. One lives in Peoria, Illinois. One lives in uh, Middletown, Ohio. All I had to leave here to hunt work. Mr. Mitchell, how long have you run this store? Well, I opened this store about 52. How was business then? Well, business was pretty fair. What's made the difference? Automation made the difference. At that time, why, we had a lot of little coal mines running here, all up and down, all up and down these hollers with little coal mines. And uh, these were all operated by hands, and for the machine, the biggest machine we had in them was a pony to haul it out, you know, mine the coal and haul it out, you know, and dump it over. The men, they took a breast over, you know, and they got in there and they drilled out this coal, you know, and shot it. And, Tamped it by hand and <laughs> everything. So now that's all gone. The ponies are all gone. Uh, modern machineries went in and took out. It's run these little mines out. They didn't need no more. They can't work no more. These hand men, they can't. The price of coal has got so low that they can't mine this coal for what these machine people can do. You know. So all mines that's running now, they have joys and they have loading machines and they have uh, electric drills and they have. Uh, it's all automation. Imagine kneeling or lying down in three or four inches of water in a black hole in a mountain and swinging a pick 10 hours a day to mine two tons of coal and then shoveling it into a wheelbarrow and wheeling it all out and collecting six dollars for your work and you will know what it is like to be a truck miner. But I.B. Johnson has not been able to find even that kind of steady job for 11 months. Dismissed by his employer, deserted by his union, unneeded by his community, ignored by his country except for $56 a month in food stamps, I.B. Johnson mines only enough coal now to keep his own family warm. And nobody pays him for that. When he was 21, eight years ago, he tried to get out of these hills. He went to Florida, he went to Georgia, and in the end he came back to the hollow where he was born, penniless and jobless, and married Lucille, thinking things might be better that way. He's glad he did, but things are no better. 
Now, like so many, I.B. Johnson is waiting for an opening in one of the scattered Job Corps camps or vocational schools the government is talking so much about. He applied last June, and he's growing desperate because there is Rita, who Lucille named for Rita Hayworth, and Mickey, whom I.B. named for Mickey Mantle, and Norman and Jimmy, and by New Year's Day, there will be another baby in the hospital bills to pay. And I.B. Johnson's abiding fear is that his children's lives will turn out like his. How many children were there in your family? There was 15. There was 10 boys and five girls. Now there's 10 living out all. And how much education did your brothers and sisters get? Well, I went through the fourth grade, and I think that was the highest that either one ever went. The rest of them stopped along the second and third, along there. Do you hope for more for your children? I certainly do. That's the reason I'm trying. I know if we go on day by day, just working down the end of these truck mines, why well, they're going to grow up and not get education. That's one reason I'm so interested in this vocational thing. If I can get night and get a skill and get them a, get a good job, well, then I'll know they're going to get a good education. And if they get a good education, I figure they can do a lot better than we did because they'll be able to get a job. What will you do on Christmas Day? Well, I'll probably just sit around the house with the kids and make them as happy as possible, but that might not be too happy for a Christmas Day. They'll have probably, well, I don't know just what to eat, but it'll mostly be hard food because on $56 worth of food stamp, you got to eat, you know, after Christmas, same as before. You've got to always remember that. Will Rita have a Christmas at school? No. She was telling me yesterday evening that they would, uh, was going to draw names, but when they come to find out about Ten of the kids in her classroom, which is about 30, wouldn't even have money to buy presents, so they're not even going to draw names. Not going to exchange no presents at all. Mickey's old enough to be expecting a Christmas, I guess, isn't he? Well, he keeps asking me. He'll say, am I going to get a wagon? I'll say, yes, if Daddy gets to work, you'll get a wagon. But he's beginning to understand now that time's running out. I'm not going to get to work in time to get him a wagon. I.B. Johnson and his brothers, growing up on the Beaver Creek, remember the good times which came before the bad. Once the mining camp they live in was the trading center for this whole valley. Now the business section of Weeksbury, Kentucky is abandoned. I.B.'s brother, Calvin Johnson, calls it a ghost town, with only the people still in it. What was this old building here, Mr. Johnson? Well, it was a theater. We, you'd take around Christmas time, why people would come for in Europe. We'd have dances and uh, boxing and music and all kinds of big times in it. It really was nice, and it would really be full. And we had somewhere to go, and people had somewhere to come to, you see. At them times, we had plenty here. And uh, What about this building up here? What was that? Well, that was our... That was our soda fountain. We had uh, plenty in there. We had all kinds of soft drinks. Stayed full at all times. Stayed open sometimes uh, 12 o'clock in the night, day and night, just about service. And uh, it was really beautiful around Christmas. It would be decorated up. The window was all decorated up. Christmas tree and lights. And it was really beautiful. And I guess this was the store here, huh? Yeah, this was the store up here. They had plenty in here, and people really coming back with some forward shopping and presents and so forth. You'd get about anything you wanted there, and they kept about anything you wanted, and now there's not anything. Calvin Johnson lives on the Caleb Fork of Beaver Creek, just down the hill from his brother. He is nearly blind from his 14 years in the mines, and lucky to be, in a way, for it increases his Social Security benefits and puts food on his table. Goldie Johnson cooks for seven, her three children, her daughter's husband, and her granddaughter of two and a half, besides herself and Calvin Johnson. In the yard, there are the dead outlines of a flower garden Goldie Johnson tried to keep one forgotten spring and then gave up on. She has worked hard every day of her marriage and there is nothing conceivable that can stop her work as long as she lives. 
and she knows now it will have to be a life without flowers. She is a strong woman, surrounded by exhausted men and living in an exhausted land. When Goldie Johnson speaks of Christmas, it is as if she lived in a country far removed from ours. Of course, she does. Well, up in, uh, till 60, uh, 53, Christmas was uh, the day that children look forward to. And today, Christmas is, will be just like today for them. This Christmas, many of them in this holler, in that other holler, in there, number one. And, uh, well, Christmas won't be no more than today because uh, they're, they've got nothing to look for. They've got no way of getting it. Their daddies and mothers got no way of getting it. And since then, they have been teached that they can't have these things. They've been disappointed so many times. It'd just be a dark night, something like tonight for them. There won't be much for them to look forward to, but used to, they had uh, more to look to for. They had joy, and they felt peace at Christmas time. Everybody you met was in the Christmas spirit. Because I know if I was to go in there and tell mine, of course, mine is grown, I have a granddaughter in there. If I was to say, I'll get you uh, something cost $10 Christmas, I couldn't get it. I couldn't promise them. For that reason, us mothers and fathers, we just about quit promising that to our children because we know we can't get it. Does Christmas still have any religious meaning to people? Well, I don't know. They just live from day to day in hopes. But Christmas, some homes will have a, a dinner and the table will be blessed in some way. But they go to church and they pray as hard as they ever did, but don't seem like it. They hardly ever night that you can't go to church someplace or other here. It's going to have to get better because it can't get no worse. If it don't get get better, they just ain't going to be much in here for nobody. And it's not only this place, there are plenty more like it. And children, I, I hope and wish that children could have what they used to have. And if not all they used to have, part anyway. Because little children, when it comes to children, I always could stand a grown-up's disappointment and downfalls, but children, I don't think they should have to suffer the way that they do in the world of plenty and, uh, and us with nothing. Goldie Johnson's granddaughter, Paula, two and a half, I get that old teddy bear. Looking through a Christmas catalog. I get this, I get that. The coal cars roll on through Christmas week carrying the wealth of Appalachia away. The trains carry coal, never people. The people wait, most of them, just off the right of way, and back off the road, and farther back in the hollows. A million people wait. Lewis Hall's family waits, and Norman Hall does not dare ask which day is Christmas. Hiram Mitchell waits. He's decided not to bother with decoration for the store this year. I.B. Johnson waits, hoping to make the children as happy as he can, but that, as he says, might not be too happy for a Christmas day. And up on the hill at the head of Pert Creek, Ollie Baker reads to her daughter from a book of ancient stories. Little Bethlehem was full of people. 
There was no room for Marie and Joseph in the inn, so they slept that night in his stable. And there, in the quiet dark, while the friendly animals were sleeping and the golden stars shone in the sky, God sent his son to be Murray's baby boy. Murray wrapped him in soft clothes. Then she made a bed of straw and laid her baby in the manger. It was very quiet. Then a shepherd spoke. Let us go to little Bethlehem, he said. Let us find the child, for the Lord has sent us good news of him. The other shepherds nodded. Step, step, step. They started down the road. Then faster and faster they walked until they came at last to little Bethlehem. And there they found Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus lying in a manger bed, and the shepherds knelt down and worshipped him. The news of the baby Jesus was too wonderful to keep. The shepherds told everyone they met about the Savior of the world. We have seen the baby Jesus, the shepherds said. He is lying in a manger bed in the little town of Bethlehem, just as the angel of the Lord said. The people wondered at this story of the angel and the shining light and his message to them. Murray thought about what the shepherds told and remembered every word. The shepherds went back to their fields, and as they went, they praised God for all the things they had heard and seen. Murray and Joseph loved the little baby God had sent. They named him Jesus, just as the angels had told them to do. And that was the first Christmas. Isn't that a wonderful story? Yeah. When the baby who was born that night grew up to be a man, he went into the mountains. And the first words he said to his disciples there were, Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It is a promise that will be cherished on the anniversary of his birth in these mountains by these poor. It is all they have. Good night. This has been a CBS News special report. Christmas in Appalachia. With Charles Kuralt.